Coming up on this episode of Typology and Prophecy. Now, immediately after finding out from Jesus how he would die, it says that, Then Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following. Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, But Lord, what about this man? Having just learned that he would be crucified, now Peter wanted to know how John was going to die. Welcome to Typology and Prophecy. My name is Kyle. This is a podcast dedicated to the study of the Bible through the methodology of typology. Today we're going to take on the question, why was John the Apostle the only one of Christ's disciples to die in old age, and most importantly, of natural causes? According to tradition, we understand that all the other disciples died a martyr's death, save Judas, of course, who hung himself shortly after betraying the Lord. For example, Peter was crucified upside down, Andrew, his brother, was crucified on an X-shaped cross, and it is believed that the Apostle Paul was beheaded in Rome. In Matthew chapter 16, Jesus said to his disciples, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. Now, as already mentioned, for Andrew and Peter, this ultimately ended up being a very literal invitation for them to join Jesus in the experience of dying by crucifixion. However, for most of us, the command to take up our crosses and follow Jesus, well, this has more of a spiritual rather than a literal application. Now, what is that spiritual application? Well, between the following statements of Jesus and Paul, we are given a clear description of what this spiritual crucifixion entails. Jesus answered them, Most surely I say to you, whoever commits sin is a slave of sin. Paul added, For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection, knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. Now what this is ultimately going to come down to is the flesh versus the spirit, or as Jesus said to Nicodemus, that even religious people need to be born again. It is also going to come down to us understanding that there is an aspect of Jesus that is attractive to even the natural heart. However, There is another aspect of Jesus and to the gospel that is repulsive to the flesh. And because of this repulsion, the hearts of many professed Christians are never actually born again. Now, before we continue, I need to illustrate something, and that is that there is a typological distinction made in Scripture between the grace of the Incarnation and the grace of the cross. In 1 John chapter 5, it reads, This is he who came by water and blood. Notice there are two typological symbols here. Jesus Christ, not only by water, but by water and blood. And it is the Spirit who bears witness, because the Spirit is truth. In total, John uses three typological values, the truth, which he attributes to the Holy Spirit, and the water and the blood, which he attributes to Jesus. Let's continue. For there are three that bear witness in heaven, the Father, the Word, and the Holy Spirit, and these three are one. And there are three that bear witness on earth, the Spirit, that's one out of the three, the water and the blood, which are the other two out of the three, and which we just learned from above, are talking about Jesus. And these three, John says, agree as one. Now, when it comes to the typology of the New Covenant, there are three primary types that both define what the New Covenant is, as well as serve as parallel symbolism for what John has just revealed here in this text. These three are the bread, the wine, and the oil. Now, considering that the oil is a symbol of the Holy Spirit, this would then leave 
the other two, i.e. the bread and the wine, to both represent Jesus. Now, not only is this consistent with how John attributed the water and the blood to Jesus, this is also consistent with how, at the Lord's Supper, Jesus forever canonized the typology of the bread and the wine as both the centerpiece of our worship of him and as typological evidence that there are, in fact, two graces that we must experience in Christ. You see, if we want to be saved, we must experience all three graces, the grace of the bread, the grace of the wine, and the grace of the oil. Now, not to exclude the importance of the oil, however, for this episode, I want to focus solely on the contrast between the bread and the wine, which, of course, both represent Jesus. You see, as we continue on with the narrative that we're going to look at, in our attempt to answer the mystery as to why the Apostle John escaped a martyr's death, what we need to understand is that all of the characters involved shared equally in the experience of Christ's incarnation. However, they did not share equally in the experience of Christ's death. Speaking of which, let's establish who did share, literally speaking, in the experience of Christ's death, as in, who was actually there with Jesus at the cross when he died. Reading from John's Gospel, it says, Now there stood by the cross of Jesus his mother, and his mother's sister Mary the wife of Cleopas, and Mary Magdalene. When Jesus therefore saw his mother and the disciple whom he loved standing by, that would be John, that's how John referred to himself as the disciple that Jesus loved, He said to his mother, Woman, behold your son. Then he said to the disciple, Behold your mother. And from that hour the disciple took her to his own home. So at the foot of the cross, there with Jesus were his mother and Mary the wife of Clopas. These were his relatives. Now from amongst all those who were his followers, we find that only Mary Magdalene, and John were present at the cross. Let's first talk about Mary Magdalene for a moment. In the Gospel of Luke, we read, Now it came to pass afterward that he went through every city and village preaching and bringing the glad tidings of the kingdom of God. And the twelve were with him. And certain women who had been healed of evil spirits and infirmities, Mary called Magdalene, out of whom had come seven demons. What this verse is telling us is that Mary was a follower of Jesus. Of course, she was not the only one, as verse 3 mentions three other women and refers to a group of unnamed many others. Now, when it says that these women were followers of Jesus, this is not in the sense that they had just encountered him once and therefore they believed that he was the Messiah. That was true. They did believe he was the Messiah. But beyond just that, these women, and specifically we're focusing in here on Mary Magdalene, they followed Jesus around from city to village, hearing his preaching, seeing his miracles, and, as it says here in verse 3, provided for him from their substance. Now, given this hint of information, it is likely that Mary Magdalene was a woman of means. From a purely financial standpoint, This would mean then that she was not some charity case who was following Jesus around, living off of his good graces. Rather, out of her abundance and her gratitude, she contributed to the needs of his ministry. You see, what this story teaches us is that when somebody of means is delivered from the bondage of demonic possession, all that they have, in gratitude for said deliverance, they freely offer in service to their Lord. However, when an individual of means has not yet been delivered from sin, let alone demonic possession, there is often a lack of attraction and a willingness to be set free, specifically because of those means. For example, in contrast to Mary, who did follow Jesus and was actually present at the foot of the cross when he died, There was another individual, also of means, 
who Jesus had given the same invitation to. Of course, we're talking about the story of the rich young ruler, who came to Jesus asking, What shall I do that I may inherit eternal life? Now, Jesus initially referred the young man to the Ten Commandments, which the young ruler replied, Teacher, all these things I have kept from my youth. Then Jesus looked at him sternly and was offended and condemned him to hell for being a legalist. Oh, wait. Is that not what it says? Hmm. Look, this may be hard for the anti-legalists out there, but Jesus wasn't triggered or offended by someone who kept the Ten Commandments. He did not berate him as a legalist. Rather, it says, then Jesus looking at him loved him. But he also added, one thing you lack, go your way and sell whatever you have and give to the poor and you will have treasure in heaven. And this is the important part. Come take up the cross and follow me. Jesus loved this young man like he loved Mary. And he invited him to both follow him and take his place beside Mary at the foot of the cross. However, this rich young ruler was not there at the cross when Jesus died, because unfortunately it says, he was sad at this word and went away sorrowful, for he had great possessions. I guess between Mary and the rich young ruler, the moral of the lesson is, it's easier to be saved from demon possession than it is to be saved from the possession of our riches. Look, the rich young ruler will not be lost because he was a legalist. No, rather he will be lost because of his love of money. You know, we should always be mindful of Christ's counsel to the church of the Laodiceans. He said, I know your works, that you were neither cold nor hot. I could wish that you were cold or hot. So then, because you are lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my mouth. Now, why were they lukewarm and in danger of Jesus vomiting them out of his mouth? He's speaking to the church here, by the way. It says, Because you say I am rich and have become wealthy and have need of nothing and do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. Jesus told them, I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich. We need to understand this. The only way to buy the gold that Jesus told us to buy from him is through the fire that is us picking up our own crosses and following Jesus to where he died on his. However, as Jesus illustrated with regards to the rich young ruler, and as he stated here in his rebuke to the Laodiceans, the love of money will be the primary reason that many will not accept this invitation and will not be found at the foot of the cross. Was this not the very reason why Judas was not at the foot of the cross? It says, Then Mary took a pound of costly oil of spikenard, anointed the feet of Jesus, and wiped his feet with her hair, and the house was filled with the fragrance of oil. But one of his disciples, Judas Iscariot, Simon's son, who would betray him, said, Why was this fragrant oil not sold for 300 denarii and given to the poor? This he said, not that he cared for the poor, but because he was a thief, and he had the money box, and he used to take what was put in it. Judas was not at the cross because to him, 30 pieces of silver was more valuable than the Lord God Almighty. Out of all those who could have, and I would argue should have been there, it was Mary Magdalene at the foot of the cross, a woman of means and a woman for whom Jesus had cast out seven demons. I guess after that type of deliverance, one could say that she was not about to leave Jesus aside even if it meant standing with him at the foot of the cross. But on the flip side, I guess we could also say, in regards to those who were absent from the cross, that they had not yet experienced that type of deliverance that Mary had. Perhaps they were too focused on their desire to be delivered from the Romans and who would be the greatest in the coming kingdom, that they had not yet considered their need for the deliverance from sin. 
In the following verse, I want you to notice something. I want you to notice the honor that Jesus bestowed upon Mary Magdalene. It says, Now when he rose early on the first day of the week, he appeared what? That's right. It says he appeared first to Mary Magdalene, out of whom he had cast seven demons. The very first person to see Jesus after his resurrection was Mary Magdalene. And it goes on to say that she was the very one who brought the good news of Christ's resurrection to his disciples. Think about that. The first resurrection sermon, if you will, ever preached was by none other than Mary Magdalene. The first human heart to ever leap for joy and beam with the glory of the news of Christ's resurrection was the heart of a woman who had once been the dwelling place of demons. Can we not say that this is truly amazing grace? To not only save those who have fallen to the deepest depths of the abyss of sin, but to raise them up and to honor them in the way that Jesus honored Mary Magdalene. This should give hope to all of us that God's grace is sufficient to save even us. Now, Do you think there is a correlation between this honor that was bestowed upon Mary and the fact that she was one out of the only two non-relative followers of Jesus to be found at the foot of the cross? Because I do. I think she was the first to share in the resurrection because she was the first to share in the cross. I believe this also establishes a framework that helps us to answer the question for this episode. Which is why was John the only apostle not to die a martyr's death? Now, before we get to that, let's first talk about Peter for a moment. Because I believe that Peter should have been at the cross. And I think that we need to understand why he was not. Of course, we know right off the bat that for Peter, it wasn't because of a love of money. No, he loved the Lord far too much than to betray him over something as worthless as gold and silver. However, and unfortunately so, he did not yet love the Lord more than he hated the thought of the cross and the humiliation that came along with it. We read from Matthew chapter 16, When Jesus came into the region of Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples, Who do men say that I, the Son of Man, am? So they said, some say John the Baptist, some Elijah, and others Jeremiah, or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered it and said, you are the Christ, the Son of the living God. Jesus answered and said to him, blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. Now, what the Father had revealed to Peter was the Incarnation. However, and please pay close attention to this, what had not yet been revealed to Peter was the second aspect of Christ's redemptive work. The first, symbolized by the water and the bread, was the Incarnation. However, the second was the cross, symbolized by the blood and the wine. Look, Peter understood the Incarnation because he was basking in the presence of it day in and day out but he had no clue what the in-purpose of the Incarnation was. And when he found out, it offended him. Just moments after Peter confessed his faith in the Incarnation, it says this, From that time Jesus began to show his disciples that he must go to Jerusalem and suffer many things from the elders and chief priests and scribes and be killed and raised the third day. Then Peter took him aside and began to rebuke him, saying, Far be it from you, Lord. This shall not happen to you. But he turned and said to Peter, Get behind me, Satan. You are an offense to me, for you are not mindful of the things of God, but the things of men. Look, we need to understand this. Peter confessed faith in the Incarnation, and Jesus affirmed him, saying that the Father had revealed it to him. Yet at the exact same time, 
Peter refused to accept the cross. And Jesus rebuked him, saying, In addition to get behind me, Satan, that Peter was mindful of the things of men. In other words, Peter had the mind of the flesh, and therefore he was moved and impassioned by the things of the flesh. Paul said, For those who live according to the flesh set their minds on the things of the flesh, but those who live according to the Spirit, the things of the Spirit. In other words, like Nicodemus, Peter, even after fully confessing faith in the Incarnation, still needed to be born again. In Peter's experience, there was a gap between his acceptance of the Incarnation and his surrender to the cross. In fact, I would argue that there is a time in every Christian's experience when this same gap exists. There are many in Christendom today who profess faith in Jesus as the Son of God, but like Peter, they want nothing to do with the redemptive work of the cross. Why? Because it involves the death of their old man. Immediately after Jesus rebuked Peter, he said, If anyone desires to come after me, let him deny himself, take up his cross, and follow me. The Apostle Paul explained in more detail exactly what this looks like in the Christian life. He wrote, What shall we say then? Shall we continue in sin that grace may abound? Certainly not. How shall we who died to sin live any longer in it? Or do you not know? That as many of us as were baptized into Christ Jesus, were baptized into his death, that's the taking up of the cross that Jesus was talking about. Therefore, we were buried with him through baptism into death, that just as Christ raised from the dead by the glory of the Father, even so we also should walk in newness of life. That's what it means to be born again. A new life lived in the Spirit where our minds are set on the things of the Spirit and not as Peter's was at the time, on the things of men and the things of the flesh. Paul continues, For if we have been united together in the likeness of his death, certainly we also shall be in the likeness of his resurrection. Is this not what we learned from Mary Magdalene? That when you share in the cross, you likewise share in the resurrection? Knowing this, that our old man was crucified with him, that the body of sin might be done away with, that we should no longer be slaves of sin. Look, the grace of the Incarnation is meant to be easy to accept. It does not require us to do anything other than just allow ourselves to be drawn to Christ and enjoy being in His presence. That's why sinners like prostitutes and tax collectors felt comfortable being in Christ's presence. The Incarnation is literally God with us. It does not require us to work our way up to God, but rather just accept the fact that He came down to us. Look, I don't know what the exact number is, but I would say that something like 90% of the four Gospels is all about the story of the Incarnation. It's the story that tells us like no other exactly who God is and what He is like. And the primary purpose of the story of the Incarnation is both to tell and to show you that God loves you. Yes, just the way you are. However, you have to know that this is coming. He also loves you way too much to leave you just the way you were when you first came to Him. While He did not condemn the woman caught in adultery, He did tell her, go and sin no more. The true gospel of Jesus involves both the bread and the wine, both the incarnation and the cross. But unlike the incarnation, which again is attractive and easy to accept, the cross, not so much. The cross is the hard part. On the evening before his trial began, Jesus tried to warn Peter how he was about to fall from grace, and probably more importantly, how Jesus would be there to welcome him back after his repentance. It reads, And the Lord said, Simon, Simon, indeed Satan has asked for you, that he may sift you as wheat, but I have prayed for you that your faith should not fail, and when you have returned to me, 
strengthen your brother. But he said to him, Lord, I am ready to go with you both to prison and to death. Look, Peter was sincere. He meant every word that he said. Well, that was, of course, until a little servant girl ridiculed him for being a follower of Jesus. His sword was still wet from the blood of the ear he had just cut off in defense of his Lord, when with cursing and swearing he denied Jesus, just as Jesus had predicted that he would. You see, Peter believed what he said, while he still thought there was glory to be gained. Look, glory has always been attractive to the flesh. That's why when the message has been, that by sword we will defeat the enemies of God both in the physical and in the spiritual realms, there has never been a shortage of crusaders ready to fight for absolution. Starting with Peter himself, who was the first ever to draw the sword and to strike in defense of our Lord. But you know what? Peter was also the very first ever to deny the cross. The reason that most of us don't find deliverance from sin attractive, let alone something that we are willing to submit to, is because there is no glory in it. Rather, and just as it was for our Lord himself, there is only the prospect of shame and humiliation to be found in the death of the cross. That shame and humiliation overwhelmed Peter. And again, with cursing and swearing, he denied Our Lord, His Lord, the one He was ready just moments before to fight to the death for. After His resurrection, Jesus appeared to His disciples who were fishing at the time. It says, So when they had eaten breakfast, Jesus said to Simon Peter, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me more than these? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Feed my lambs. He said to him again a second time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? He said to him, Yes, Lord, you know that I love you. He said to him, Tend my sheep. He said to him a third time, Simon, son of Jonah, do you love me? Peter was grieved because he said to him a third time, Do you love me? And he said to him, Lord, you know all things. You know that I love you. Jesus said to him, feed my sheep. You see, it was because Peter had denied him three times that Jesus asked him three times, do you love me? I believe it is also because Peter was absent from the foot of the cross that Jesus likewise said the following, most assuredly I say to you, when you were younger, you girded yourself and walked where you wished. But when you are old, you will stretch out your hands and another will gird you and carry you where you do not wish. This he spoke, signifying by what death he would glorify God. And when he had spoken this, he said to him, Follow me. First of all, let's acknowledge and praise God for the abundance of his grace in restoring Peter to the ministry that he had called him to. For this indeed gives us hope when it comes to our own shortcomings. However, as verse 18 and 19 show, Peter was not let off the hook when it came to the issue of the cross. For Jesus revealed to Peter that when the time came for him to die, he would die by crucifixion just as he himself had. When that time did come, Peter, feeling unworthy to die in the same manner as did his Lord, requested to be crucified upside down, which was honored. Look, on the one hand, The cross can represent a multitude of things when applied to the individual lives of Christ's followers. We do not all struggle with the same things, nor must we all suffer the same trials and tribulations. However, with regards to the essential truth that applies to everyone who desires to be saved, the cross represents the death of the flesh. Of course, this cannot be decoupled from the resurrection in the new life, that we live in the Spirit once we are born again. However, the fact still remains, the flesh must first die before it can be resurrected, i.e. born again. No matter how creative we get at circumventing the experience, 
or how many times we pull off delaying it. If we are to be saved in the end, we will experience the cross. There is no escaping it as Peter found out some 2,000 years ago. Peter most likely died by crucifixion because by his absence at the foot of the cross, he proved that he had not yet repented of his earlier denial of the cross. The very thing that was the most offensive to Peter, that when it was actually taking place, led to his denial of the Lord, was now the very reality that he had to look forward to all the days of his ministry for the Lord. Although his confession in the Incarnation that Jesus was the Son of God was evidence that the Father was working in Peter, this was not to be mistaken as a get-out-of-jail, i.e. get-out-of-the-cross-free card. Yes, it is true that we first enter into the promise of salvation through the grace of the Incarnation. If you don't start there, you won't be saved. That's why no one who is following an Arian gospel will be saved because they deny the Incarnation. But make no mistake about this. Jesus said that man shall not live by bread alone, which means that we are not saved by faith in the Incarnation alone. Rather, we need all three, the bread, the wine, and the oil. And remember this, the Apostle John said these three agree as one, meaning they come as a package deal. No one has the authority to teach that only one of the three essential graces is salvational, while the other two are merely optional accessories. Now, immediately after finding out from Jesus how he would die, it says that, Then Peter, turning around, saw the disciple whom Jesus loved following, who also had leaned on his breast at the supper and said, Lord, who is the one who betrays you? Peter, seeing him, said to Jesus, But Lord, what about this man? Having just learned that he would be crucified, now Peter wanted to know how John was going to die. However, Jesus said to him, If I will that he remains till I come, what is that to you? You follow me. Then the saying went out among the brethren that this disciple would not die. Yet Jesus did not say to him that he would not die. But if I will that he remains till I come, what is that to you? This is the disciple who testifies of these things and wrote these things, and we know that his testimony is true. In other words, John is telling us that he is speaking about himself here. You see, in the last chapter of the Gospel of John, the issue of both Peter's and John's deaths come up. I believe that Peter died the death of the cross because he refused the first time to accept the cross of Christ. Same thing with the other nine disciples who were nowhere to be found once the trial and the passion of Christ began. Out of the twelve, John was the only disciple of Christ that was there with him at both his trial and at the foot of the cross. It was there at the cross that Jesus entrusted to him the care of his own mother. I believe that John was the only one to die of natural causes because he was the only one who accepted and experienced the cross the first time around. And like Mary Magdalene was the first to learn about and then tell the church about the revelation of Christ's resurrection, So likewise, in his later years, Jesus returned to John on the island of Patmos, and John was the first to learn about and to share with the church the revelation of Jesus Christ. Look, in closing, my purpose is not to tell you, or myself for that matter, that we should get it right the first time, or else it will be harder later on. There may be times when that is true, But the frank reality is that the odds of us getting it right the first time are not in our favor. The point here is not about achieving a perfect record. However, make no mistake about it. What God has ordained as necessary for our salvation, it will come to pass. We can resist it, delay it, and try and negotiate our way out of it. But at the end of the day, when we finally choose to submit... God will be there, patiently waiting, to lay the cross of His choosing 
upon our shoulders. So yes, I would say it is better to submit to the cross sooner rather than later, but even with that said, we should never despair over our past failures. For as Paul said, where sin abounded, grace abounded much more. Well, that would do it for this episode of Timeology and Prophecy. If you stuck with me to the end, you are super awesome. Please leave me a comment down below and let me know what you think. If you were blessed, please smash that like button and consider supporting me by purchasing one or even both of my books. They're available on Amazon. Links are in the description and pinned comment below. Thank you for joining me today and God bless.